I can't go through all of this because it would take too much time. Uh, I find some difficulty in preparing this letter to Mr. Blackstone, as he is a complainer, and I think has always charged us, he has already charged us twice with not having fulfilled our promises. So he's making demand. Um, in a response, uh, a, a, a well-known curator by the name of William Henry Holmes uh, writes, the museum cannot take official action regarding collections arriving in bond from Mexico um, on the account of the danger of international difficulties. Um, and finally, in the return, so these guys are going back and forth a little bit about what are we going to do with this guy? He's kind of a pain in the you know what. And um, he's actually doing some to live the, 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 some stuff that's going to come home to bite us uh, in the rear at some point. And finally, uh, to him, they say, you are doubtless aware that the Mexican government has forbidden the removal of certain objects of antiquity from that country. I do not feel, therefore, that we can make an official request for the free entry. Um, but the non-official request is fine, and we'll hold on to the floor. Um, here is another, th this sort of goes up the, uh, the hierarchy. This sort of gets bumped upstairs. Um, it kind of always reminds me of being, being in a bureaucracy, and you know, you try to get things sort of taken care of down at the lower level, but you're always enraging higher level entities in the bureaucracy with having to deal with problems that you should have dealt with yourself, I suppose. Regard to the Blackstone collections about which you sent me a memorandum yesterday, I beg to say that I am in favor of bringing our arrangement with Mr. Blackstone to an end. If he wishes to offer them for sale, however, the museum will be glad to know his price. So there's sort of a kind of a double, a double-edged uh, uh, sense of this. Um, well, it's, this is bad stuff, but how much does he want? <laughs> um, this is from the assistant secretary, so that would be like the provost, right? Not the president, but the provost. And um, he's writing, um, it, it's, it's the curator writing and advising the assistant secretary. So there's some interaction. Soon thereafter, we get this letter in response to whatever response that the, the, the provost, the, the assistant secretary, the big guy, uh, says, um, oh, by the way, okay, we're going to take this other information into consideration. Mr. Blackstone is a resident of Maryland and a nephew of ex-congressman George A. Peer, who took some interest in having the museum care for stuff. Um, he offered stuff to the museum, and, you know, uh, it seems like this is good stuff. Um, I believe he's a man of considerable means. <laughs> Maybe a donation. Um, the collections transmitted, he goes through what they are. Um, it's very difficult for me to say whether Mr. Blockinson intends to present the collections or present them to the museum, or whether he's merely using the museum as a convenience in amassing collections for the purpose not known to us. So, are we being used? Um, well, that answer is comes for short four years later, after the objects and the uh, remains have, re have been in the museum for a while and uh, kind of legitimated in that new context. And um, here, Blackstone, you can see his flourishing uh, signature here, is writing another guy who is Mr. Hyde, who has a museum in New York, and he wants to sell them to Mr. Hyde. So we know what his purpose was now, was to establish a price and to sell them elsewhere. Um, and he's inquiring uh, if Mr. Hyde wants to buy that stuff. Uh, he says he'll, he'd like to get five grand. He'll go as low as 4,000 cash. Um, uh, it's really good stuff. You'll never find anything quite like it. And there was a lot of material there. There, there was an incredible collection. A collection that's still head by the National Museum of the American Indian because Mr. Hyde's museum was later acquired by the government. So that's that part, what goes around comes around. Um, so they got it back. But this time, instead of going back to the National Museum, it goes to another kind of museum. 
And then I thought this was sort of cool. P.S. You probably know it is against. This is this is blackest of talking. It is against the law to export archaeological specimens from Mexico nowadays. That these laws are being more strictly enforced. <laughs> so everybody knew what was going on. All sorts of blinks. And um, um, there they go. Here's the the receipt. Um, I guess. Old high got him down another two hundred and fifty dollars because the <laughs> price only was three thirty seven fifty. And um, that ends that part. So they they go around and, and they eventually find themselves in what becomes the National Museum of the American Indian, which has a much different philosophy than the other museum I talked about, which is sort of science oriented and not particularly interested in repatriating anything. And uh, this other museum that is gung-ho to repatriate stuff because that's more in keeping with their mission to create a place appropriate for the involvement of the community, the community being Native Americans, in the context of the museum. So they want them to go home. So who are these guys? I think I have a little bit more time. Right? Some, some questions. Okay, I'll say at least seven minutes of your question. So that gives me four or five more. So who are they? Briefly, these are their identity cards, their catalog cards in the museum. And as you can see, uh, actually there were seven months to begin with. And by the time 2001 rolls around, there's only four left. So something happened. Um, what probably happened is that they got lost or destroyed. Um, so some of the individuals are gone now, and we're down to four. An adult, uh, an infant, um, and two individuals of intermediate age. And these are the pieces of uh, records that go along with them uh, in the museum. They're stored today in a vault because the sense, philosophy, uh, paradigm of the museum is to kind of take them out of the collections and put them in, well, a limbo, for want of a better term, as they become prepared to go back to where uh, they were uh, inter first interred. Um, science, in terms of their history, one scientific report in the hundred years uh, that they've been there, a simple um, um, x-ray study that identified some markings of malnutrition uh, during the lives of these individuals. The, the, the infant didn't have any, but the older people did, suggesting that these guys were much like other hunters and gatherers around the world that have occasionally experienced some stress during their life uh, when a particular harvest of this or that doesn't quite pan out. Um, this is one of the individuals. This is the older guy. Um, we have information from people like Alum holds on how perhaps relatives of these individuals from Cave Valley were prepared in the not too distant ethnographic time. And so we know about that. Um, we also know that this is ongoing. These graves are being uh, broken into today. So here is an individual who's sort of been just sort of pushed to the side because obviously they want to get the pots and the artifacts. Those are the things that can be easily sold. Um, other information on how these people might have been interred, a little bit more of breathing life or rekindling uh, part of their network um, can come both from the ethnographic record uh, as well as talking to people. So we have information from groups in the Sierra today that might help us. And the, the relatives of these people, the descendants of these people, this is a, more than 100 years old now, um, might be sources of relatives to which these individuals could be returned. We also have information about these guys from the historic record. Um, one particularly interesting uh, 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 entrada or, or expedition to this area um, was made by Cabeza de Vaca. That's a long story. I don't have time to get into it with you. But basically, Cabeza 